Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I know that we are a bit slow coming back from the lunch break discussions, which were extremely engaging and interesting, but it's uh, time for us to start. We have, I would say, one of the most interesting panel discussion ahead of us, but most challenging. <laughs> we have uh, quite a bit of number of speakers that bring wealth of experience with them, information that they will be ready to share with you and vision, strategic vision and a lot of information in terms of the plans for future development in the areas that we will be talking about during this session. So what we will do in terms of a little bit of housekeeping rules, we'll have introductory statements angled with uh, questions that I will pose with the speakers. Uh, and then hopefully we will have some time left enough uh, for follow-up um, session of questions or final remarks that we can have with our speakers. But knowing, uh, again, the style and experience of our speakers, I'm uh, really looking forward to a discussion that is uh, ahead of us. Before we start, there is a little video that will be shown to you, and then we'll start with the discussions right away. Please. What a dramatic historic example. Post-war France and Germany, transcending past enmities to build together the EU. What a dramatic modern challenge. Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Turkey, prepared to work together in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration for the mutual benefit of all. A contribution to prosperity, development, and trans-regional cooperation in the entire South Caucasus and the wider region a crossroad of the European and Asian major energy and transport corridors. Welcome to the panel, the role of new energy and transport corridors in Eurasian zone. Well, before approaching the speaker, it's just a very little brief introduction from my side. In this very room, uh, during uh, all Baku forums that I can recall myself, energy transport corridors have always been at the front line, so to say, front and center of discussions. And that was reflective of importance to these issues that have been attached and has been attached by leadership of countries representing this region, by the leadership of Azerbaijan, President Aliyev. And we always had that thought, why is it that the discussion of these issues, and more than that, action that would have been corresponding to the importance of these issues, was somewhat lacking beyond the region to the degree that we would have wished for that to be uh, present, with the exception of countries that have been engaged from the very beginning uh, in uh, development of these projects, energy or transport for that matter. But here we are, uh, after one year of Russian invasion of Ukraine, an event uh, that above uh, security and peace and hu humanitarian related crisis hit markets dramatically. Energy markets, supply chains have been disrupted, and all of that after all of the disruption that we have experienced from COVID pandemic. So part of what we will um, try to achieve during the discussions uh, at this panel is to zoom in a bit more in terms of stock taking of where we are now. What has been done to overcome the challenges that have been posed by the disruption? But then what are the opportunities that have emerged? Because one can say that invasion became a ca catalyst and that disruption of the mar markets, not invasion per se, uh, of processes that were lacking previously. So we see acceleration of new projects, expansion of already existing ones, and then acceleration, I would say, of green transition in the energy sector as well. So, so these are the issues that are on top of our agenda today at the panel discussion. And I'm very pleased that we can open up our discussion with uh, Minister of Energy of the Republic of Azerbaijan, His Excellency, Mr. Parvis Shahbazov. Thank you uh, very much. First of all, I would like to express my thanks uh, for the invitation. It's a great privilege to participate at the 10th uh, Global Baku Forum. And uh, this forum has already uh, become 
a serious platform for uh, the global uh, uh, issues priorities, actually, I would say, the uh, global agenda priorities. And of course, it has served for the uh, advancement of the international cooperation and continues uh, to do it during this uh, forum. Um, the topic uh, itself, yet another evidence of uh, importance of this uh, platform. And before I will actually go to uh, the, our present issues, I would like to make a short um, a tour through the history of Euro-Asian continent. Let's take the ancient Silk Road mm -hmm. and talk about the corridors. With the revival of the Silk Road, the countries that lay on the path of the Silk Road began to develop and prosper. With the closure of this route, they always began to lose, to fail, the economy weakened. And the situation we have today is no different from uh, one which was, which, uh, was then in those times. And we can see that all these energy and transport corridors that we are now uh, building and connecting uh, with different regions uh, within this continent bring a lot of benefits. And I am not talking about economic benefits. We also have to take into account the uh, opportunities that these corridors create for the countries to build their bilateral relations, be it political, economic again, or cultural. And at the same time, it is a great advantage for the multilateral cooperation between those countries. That's why the topic is extremely important. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, has been pursuing uh, the um, energy policy since already uh, many years in a way that it has uh, provided for the secure and safe energy resources, not only for itself, but also for the countries of the region and even beyond our region, for the entire, in principle, uh, the European continent. And uh, the first, let's say, uh, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan project, uh, which uh, for the first time delivered the oil resources from the Caspian Sea to the international oil market and then uh, Southern Gas Corridor. Of course, it has started with Baku Tbilisi Erzurum project. And uh, today we have already the situation when we talk about the expansion of this project. And of course, uh, we don't stop. We have new ideas. And uh, yesterday, during uh, his speech, His Excellency, Mr. President uh, Ilham Aliyev, uh, just presented his vision on the energy policy of uh, Azerbaijan. Of course, he has touched upon the projects that we uh, have on our agenda uh, to be realized with our partners. And I would like also to use this opportunity and to inform the audience about uh, our future plans. Of course, uh, the secure and safe delivery of the energy resources plays an enormous role. Sometimes uh, the, even uh, the availability of resources and infrastructure uh, is insufficient to realize those plans. That's why Azerbaijan has been always uh, trying to build uh, or to contribute into the construction of those energy uh, paths, energy corridors, in a way that it creates uh, the absolutely uh, acceptable and conducive conditions for the realization of these projects. And 
given the uh, today uh, uh, the geopolitical situation we have, of course, uh, we will uh, we are witnessing uh, the case when it uh, uh, seriously impacts uh, on uh, the uh, present situation here, also in the region and also on the a network of the uh, energy and transport corridors. And of course, um, having all this in mind, I would like just to add that uh, uh, these energy corridors not only uh, give us the opportunity uh, to uh, deliver our energy resources to the different regions, to uh, our uh, partners, and let them uh, to benefit from from that and uh, uh, but at the same time it is of course uh, gives uh, the possibility uh, to provide for the sec energy security and today with the new uh, line in our energy policy which uh, was uh, especially mentioned yesterday by uh, President uh, Aliyev uh, during his speech, it is the uh, building the new uh, Caspian EU Green Corridor, mm -hmm. which uh, is going to be realized in order to bring the uh, huge ener green energy resources of Azerbaijan uh, to the European continent, and through this also make a contribution into the decarbonization. Mm -hmm and into the energy transition, which is very high on the uh, political agenda of, uh, and, and, and security agenda, actually, of the European Union. So we are going to work in this direction. I don't know how much time I took from you. I can, I, can, I can stop now and maybe sure. uh, to continue later on. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I think uh, we all remember uh, that recent uh, visits, relatively recent visits of the President of the European Union here in Azerbaijan, and then that, that statement that uh, recognized reliability as a partner of Azerbaijan in that pursuit of gaining independence and energy security uh, of Europe in so many ways. And, and that rang the bell that we've been waiting for quite some time in this region to see uh, and then to hear the recognition of importance of this part of the world when it comes to the common security, prosperity, and then development of our energy resources. And we'll come back definitely on uh, green and renewables as well because that's part of the fascinating element of the future. It's not oil and gas only, but Azerbaijan becoming an exporter and transit country as well for green and renewables. Jean, uh, you have uh, such an experience and then vision that you can share with the audience when it comes to the, 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 the vision of the region and then the role of this region as seen from outside. You are not an outsider to this region. You are heavily engaged Hopefully here. Hopefully, I feel like an insider this week. <laughs> I hope that's but the case. Let's, <laughs> let's try to zoom out and then, and then give that vision how that is seen from, from the US, that how it's seen from the corporate world, and then what are the opportunities there, and then opportunities for growth. Well, let me take some of that, and then we'll come back if we have time. First of all, I want to build on what Minister Shabazov said uh, and, and, and go forward. And also, thank you all for being here after lunch. I know how difficult that is to, to show up and, and listen to us after lunch. And it, the South Caucasus countries and the Caspian countries are in a very unique situation right now to be able to deal with both the energy crisis and the climate crisis simultaneously. Balancing sort of the existential threat of the climate crisis with the challenges of energy security has really caused a dramatic uplift in the strategic importance of this region going forward. Azerbaijan is a small country, but it punches way above its weight right now in terms of energy security. And I'm going to, for purposes of energy security, limit my comments to LNG, because that's primarily uh, moving LNG to Europe has been the big issue. Am I echoing? No. There we go. All right. So. Um, uh, uh, from an energy security standpoint, I'm going to make a few comments about LNG, but I also want to move very quickly to the transformation that's happening and the vision that I see from a perspective, if 
from an outsider coming in and becoming an insider as to what can happen. Azerbaijan has huge excess capacity. If you look at the numbers of production of oil and gas, they may not be that large. Um, uh, but what, uh, what Azerbaijan is, is it is, has one of the highest independent ratios of production in the world. They make four times more than what they demand, so they have the capability to export. So if you look at the energy security and the role of the last year and a half, if you look at uh, LNG exports, they've gone from 8 BCM billion cubic um, meters to 11, to now the goal is 20. That's huge, that's a doubling, um, a, a, a getting it to Europe. The whole idea here is demand and supply and linking um, with Europe. So the energy security piece, I think Azerbaijan has really stepped up. Um, uh, the vision of having that south gas corridor and that pipeline uh, started in 2011 and $45 billion and 10 years later, it's representing 2% into the European market. Now, in the past year, it's moved to 3.4%, I think. That's huge from a security perspective. I do want to rapidly pivot, though, to renewables because I think what we have here in Azerbaijan and this region, in the Caspian Sea region, is the ability to create probably one of the first and only complete integrated hydrogen hubs. What it takes to have an integrated hydrogen hub is renewables. You've got wind, 165 gigawatts of wind, only 24, we've got three companies that have committed to developing 24 gigawatts of that. You've got solar. I've seen various numbers from anywhere from 10 to 25 gigawatts. Um, you've got hydro. I even see that you're doing a thermal uh, plant. So there is a background of incredible renewables. So to have a hub, you've got to have renewables. Then you've got to be able to transport them. If you, if, if you think about the mantra you need to have on renewables, it's got to be transport. It doesn't make a bit of difference if you produce it and you can't get it anywhere. So the vision to have pipelines to move molecules and a cable under the Black Sea to move electrons is innovative and leading edge. So what we have here is we have renewables, we have transport capability, we have the ability on the shore of the Caspian Sea to potentially produce hydrogen, which allows you to move uh, even more through pipelines. Uh, you have enough water to, to do that. There's an R&D infrastructure within Azerbaijan. You're looking at how to blend hydrogen how to do compression so that you don't necessarily have to build another pipeline right away, but you can get more out of the existing pipeline. We're looking at how you create green hydrogen in a more efficient way, um, and, and, and then how to transport it. And the big thing that Azerbaijan has, the most scarce commodity in the renewable business is a long-term offtake agreement. You, that is the scarcest commodity, and it allows you to monetize your investment. So when you're looking for people to come in and invest, you've got to have that offtake agreement, and the EC has given it to you. And they pay their bills, right? Uh, uh, so it's a good credit risk. So when I look out ahead, I just got off of an interview, and they said, well, is this a, a one-time thing? Is this a short-term thing? And I said, no, I, I, I don't think so. Azerbaijan has the ability to take a real leadership role as the first integrated hydrogen hub in the world. Thank, thank you, Jane, for a very comprehensive overview and stock taking of developments and then more of that uh, vision and prospect for the future. Uh, Ekaterina uh, Zaharieva. It's always funny when somebody with my last name struggle sometimes with pronunciation of the last names of others, but I hope that I made it right. Uh, there is so much that you can tell to the audience when it comes to how country in the Black Sea region, member of the European Union and NATO, with the level of dependency when it comes to the energy supplies uh, on Russia, managed to overcome the challenge of disruption, and then what was the role of the Black Sea area, and then with connection of that, the Caucasus that has played uh, a role in that equation. So please, Ekaterina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eka. Uh, it's really an honor to be, for me to be uh, in this forum uh, at that moment. Uh, 
I will start with negative developments in Europe and hope to finish more positively. Uh, friends and colleagues, the, I'll be very frank. The problem of Europe was that many Western European countries took for granted for many years that uh, the Russian energy, cheap energy, will flow to Europe in interrupt without seeing and hearing the worrying, um, the growing tension that comes from East Europe frontier. So actually for years, for decades I would say, we fed the beast. We fund Putin's regime. We finance Putin's regime. Uh, so I remember many councils when we, from East Europe, Central East Europe, uh, try to say to our Western friends that it, we will not continue forever. We should diverse uh, our energy. We should in, invest more in our energy security. And unfortunately, those warnings were not heard. And this cost a lot for whole Europe, not only European Union, in money, but uh, in human lives also. We talk a lot about this awful war of aggression in Ukraine in 2022, but it didn't start in 2022. In Ukraine itself, it started 2014, but it starts even earlier in the region. It starts in Georgia in 28. So uh, I think the strongest weapon of Putin actually was a strong dependency in Europe from Russian gas and crude oil. This was his strongest weapon. This is my opinion. Uh, and I'll try to be more positive now. Uh, after this cold shower waking up in 2022, um, before 2022, 83% of gas in Europe was imported by Russia. 83 percent. Uh, and now, only for a year, it's about 20 percent. It's significant achievement, I think. Um, I am, I'm talking about Europe, not only European Union. I think in European Union, even, it's even less. For Bulgaria, we were heavily dependent on Russian gas, 95 percent in 2021. Uh, Bulgaria was the first country that Russia steps actually gas supplies, breaking the contract that we have with Gazprom. So now we have 0% import from Russian gas, from 95 to 0. And I think we managed to do this because we didn't sleep during the years. And Azerbaijan uh, plays a key role uh, in our strategy for the diversification. Uh, I was part of the Rosen Plevneliev team, uh, who is a member of Board of Trust of Nizami Ganjabi Foundation, when in 2015, I think, I think Rosen is somewhere here, maybe, I hope I'm not wrong for the, for the year, we signed a strategic partnership agreement with Azerbaijan. Uh, and then we invest a lot, as rightly minister said, because the connection is not only gas or uh, goods, but it's human. It's uh, culture, uh, it's trust, it's trust. Uh, so now one third of consumption of gas comes from Azerbaijan through, uh, to, through TAP. Uh, and um, I think, and I hope, uh, that after signing this strategic memorandum uh, in the field of energy with European Union, uh, we can increase even this uh, import. Because I really believe, seeing during the years, that Azerbaijan is a safe and a reliable partner, not only for Bulgaria, but for the whole uh, Europe. And, um, but we should not stop. And I hope this time, this, this time, we will learn our lessons. Because if you see the data, the numbers, the numbers talks a lot. 
Uh, after 2014, uh, import from Russia decreased dramatically, but it was for a couple of years, two or three, I think, not more. Uh, so I hope that this time we are clever. Uh, we will never allow to depend on one country so heavily, and we are going to invest more actively. Europe is, yes, is a front runner, yes. Everybody learns from Europe in renewable, but we should also learn from Azerbaijan for their plans and their vision not only to rely that they have gas and oil in crude oil, but also to invest in the future and renewable. So thank you. Thank you very much. You've highlighted uh, quite, quite strongly importance of action that is driven by strategic vision that is taken ahead of the time. So when the critical time comes, you are ready to undertake decisive steps and not to be uh, crippled uh, by inability to act in a very difficult situation. So all the steps that have been put forward as a foundation for that strategic partnership between Bulgaria and Azerbaijan paid off uh, quite, quite well at a time when many, and especially in Moscow, would have thought that you would be cracked in your will and determination to stand uh, by, by common decision of the EU because of that dependency that was viewed as a weapon for Moscow. Um, Anna Birchall, <laughs> dear friend, uh, <clears throat> I'll turn to you now because I think it's a very logical continuation across the Black Sea area as well to what Ekaterina already mentioned, but from the perspective of Romania, you have been at the forefront of so many strategic uh, processes that have been initiated by your government with, uh, with the partners across the Black Sea and in Caucasus with uh, Azerbaijan. So how would you describe what it took on your end to, to ensure that now you stand on the firm foot, so to say, in the way that you are, based on that strategic partnerships that have been built, and w w what is the vision for the future? more than what we have already now. Thank you so much, Eka. And firstly, it's a great honor and pleasure to be uh, back in Baku. Uh, I very much uh, uh, love being here. I think I've been coming now for five years. Um, obviously, the discussion of today, the topic of this panel, it's crucial because energy is a matter of security and always been like that. And I just want to go, um, you know, pick up the point uh, as uh, you, Eka, mentioned and Ekaterina was mentioned. And look, just um, kindly inform uh, the realities because sometimes uh, it's important to look uh, at the past to learn uh, the lessons in order to build a proper and a good uh, present, but especially a future. So we were among the first um, who actually since 2018, 19, we've been arguing on and off the record that energy is going to be used by Putin as a weapon. And uh, I was in office at that time, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, and I was the one uh, arguing heavily against Nord Stream 2, saying that the Nord Stream 2 is going to be really a serious danger for countries in our region, for Romania and um, uh, all the other countries in Central Eastern Europe. And, uh, you know, the argument at that time said, oh, come on, we know better, we understand better Russia, you are wrong. And I said, look, uh, you know, the time is going to prove us as being right. Unfortunately, that was it. So um, Romania, actually, unlike uh, Bulgaria, um, we uh, had um, since uh, many, many years a very good balanced in terms of the energy mix. Uh, since 1960s, uh, we went among the only ones in the uh, region that went, for example, on the nuclear with North American technology. We refused to go with the Russian technology. And we, we, uh, uh, we have the two reactors with the Kandu technology. And we are building now two other reactors. But uh, I want to take this opportunity, Ekan, to really mention and stress the critical role that Azerbaijan played during this critical time and the leadership of President Aliyev. Because you know what? Um, in uh, critical times, actually, you see your partners and you see your friends. Obviously, Romania has a strategic partnership with Azerbaijan, and we've been very proud of this strategic partnership. Uh, we were among the very first countries in the region who, um, you know, built up this uh, strategic partnership. And, uh, um, you know, this year's, you know, this year, this coming years, um, the 
energy, the gas coming from Azerbaijan, not just for Romania and our region, but for the whole Europe, actually saved us. That's a reality. And that was the leadership of President Aliyev, who actually stepped in and with no, uh, you know, no uh, hesitation, immediately helped out Europe and countries such as Romania. And we need to ask ourselves, where would we have been this winter without Azerbaijan's help? Where we will be next winter without Azerbaijan's help? And here you have in the panel an amazing person, an amazing minister, the Minister of Energy from Azerbaijan. Uh, he's been heavily involved in another strategic project that is coming from Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, Romania, and Hungary, is the Green Corridor Submarine Cable. And you can say, oh, come on, the submarine cable is going to, you know, uh, have the effects, the positive effects in 20 years, 15 years, 10 years. You know, I'm, I'm saying just the number. Yeah, but in order to benefit of those important effects, you need to build it up today. And uh, it was uh, President Saliev's idea, and we've been working on this uh, for a few years years, and now it's just happening. We, um, you know, we had uh, the presidential visits uh, in, in Romania and uh, in Azerbaijan, and personally, I couldn't be more happier to see the efforts of Azerbaijan as being so strategically and critical, not just for Romania, but actually for the, the whole region, because that's a, a major <coughs> role, a uh, strategic role that actually was, um, uh, was playing um, during these very difficult times when you see the effects of how energy could be used as a weapon, as it were used. And um, uh, building those corridors, diversification, uh, it is something that we need to do. And I will close up uh, just um, mentioning Shusha. I've been there three times. And I commend all of you to go and see it. I was impressed, you know, from one visit to another, the reconstruction of Shusha. And one thing that actually struck me when President Aliyev took us around, and I said, you know what? The main source of rebuilding Shusha in terms of the energy is going to be on the green, uh, green energy from new renewable. So I think the lesson that we ought to learn here is about uh, having an, the intelligence to have a, a diversified energy Energy mix. I think EU is learning the lesson to leave it to the member states to actually have that national mix according to the realities on the ground. Because, for example, in Romania, if we have energy from nuclear and we could produce energy from nuclear, we should be allowed to do it because, you know what, it's one of the cleanest sources of energy, um, for example. So. Uh, uh, I will close by, uh, again, commending the leadership and the vision, the strategic vision, but actually the, um, the help, the needed hand that actually Azerbaijan and President Aliyev gave us during a very, very difficult time. I can't imagine how Europe would have dealt this winter or the next winter or the next years without the help of Azerbaijan. And that's a reality. And I think we ought to say it uh, uh, loud and clear because, uh, you know, I'm not so sure that many people do see and understand the full support that was, uh, was played by Azerbaijan and President Aliyev. Thank you, Anna. And then there is a very important issue that you've touched during your presentation, how technology development and including green energy uh, related developments could be part of renewal, reconstruction and rebuilding of the communities that have suffered so much for so long under occupation. And I cannot but agree with you that uh, every time that I go to Shusha as well, it's so much development you can compare with the previous visit. And then energy is part of the mix in this case, creating jobs, creating future, and then creating uh, back that vision of what the economy of 21st century for the communities back then, uh, back there, that will be coming back and then renewing their lives in those territories will be in the future. Now, we've heard quite a lot um, on energy mix of, of uh, the questions that we have to cover uh, in this panel. And now we will be turning more to the transportation related corridors. And then with that, uh, again, effect and potential of all the uh, supply chain related issues that we had to deal with for now and for the future. And then we'll start with uh, His Excellency Minister um, Rashad Nabiev, uh, Minister of Digital Development and, and Transportation, Transport of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Please. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's also my pleasure to be a part of such a distinguished audience. And uh, just like you mentioned, the growing uh, complexity and actual interdependence in the global supply chains uh, and the regional events, just like the one we have witnessed several years ago, the Evergreens blockage of Suez Channel, or COVID-9 pandemic, or the recent regional conflicts have actually boosted the importance of the diversifying the transit routes. And it's especially highlighted the importance of the middle corridor, and especially the Azerbaijan. If we look from the perspective of Azerbaijan, uh, where do the uh, similarities lie in terms of energy and uh, transportation, and there is one single point is that not being heard at the time. We have been uh, highlighting the importance of the middle corridor for the last 10 years, but unfortunately our European uh, partners, they were just neglecting uh, the importance and strategic advantages this corridor can bring into the game. And it's not the secret that Azerbaijan uh, favorable location uh, serves as a natural bridge between East and west and north and south. But from our perspective, it's not about the geographical location. It's about the visionary leadership that we have had over the last 20 years, and especially when it comes to upgrading the infrastructure and investing the billions and billions of the dollars to our uh, roads and uh, rail lines and expanding the capacity which actually exceeded the local demand. And uh, it's not the uh, by occasion that uh, today uh, when this demand uh, was there, we were very much ready to meet this demand. And if you look at the numbers, uh, last year we witnessed a tremendous increase in the transit of the goods moving up through our territory. Uh, it's increased nearly by 75%, reaching uh, 11 million. And when you look at the perspective where the numbers in terms of uh, railway cargo was, it was only 4.5 million. And now we are forecasting nearly 23 million over the coming five to six years. And our further analysis conducted with the Boston Consultancy Group and with our partners from uh, Georgia and Kazakhstan show that it was a proper investment into the infrastructure with a proper cooperation and a coordination of our efforts, this number can be actually doubled over the next 10 years. And uh, being very short on that topic, uh, we have been very uh, efficient uh, working with our partners on East and the West uh, to make sure that uh, the increasing demand in, is being met uh, on a timely manner. A couple of numbers uh, are as following. Uh, within the last year, we have managed to bring the efficiency to the already existing uh, capacity. We have managed to bring the number of the days of the uh, Rolling Stokes uh, travel time from Altinko, the border of China, to the ports of uh, Poti and Batimi of Georgia from nearly 45 to 50 days to 15 to 20 days. And actually, the, and, and that's huge. And we have an answer perspective. I mean, uh, after liberating our territories, I mean, everyone talks about and uh, about the Zangezer corridor. And we believe that the Zangezer corridor can be, ad can add actually additional capacity to the capacity of the middle corridor. And uh, we do believe that uh, the closer cooperation of the regional countries, including, by the way, Armenia, mm -hmm can actually benefit not only us, but also our European partners. And the Engezer Corridor, part of the Engezer Corridor, uh, which lies within our territory, both on the uh, rail roads and also the roads, is being uh, constructed at the time being. Within the last two years, we have managed to build two international airports in liberated territories, and we have managed to lay down basically hundreds of kilometers of the roads, and also we have managed also to put into place uh, rail lines, also hundreds of kilometers. And we sincerely believe that it's not only for us, it's for broader region and for it's also uh, for our European partners. But we have to find the right formula, how we going to convince our partners uh, from the Euro Europe not to make the mistakes which they've made in the past. Probably I will stop here and if there are any other questions, I will try to come back.
we might uh, come back to that issue uh, in the follow-up questions as well of how these trends will emerge to be sort of more reliable patterns so that for the investment reasons as well, there's reliability of those diversification routes that one could see from China to the region and then to Europe rather than uh, business as usual type of <laughs> go back uh, to the previous patterns of uh, trading um, with, uh, between the East and West in that regard. Uh, I have to stand up to have a look at you, Minister, because you are so far away already. So that <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, now moving uh, to uh, the representative of Tajikistan, Minister of Transportation, uh, Azim Ibrahim, your ex, uh, his, uh, his Excellency. Yeah. Uh, I want to uh, bring your vision to this discussion now, because we hear more of how East and West works when it comes to transport corridors. Yes. But there is a yes. whole lot of dimension how to the East that could be diversified as well, okay. regionally in the Caspian okay. region, and then with the projects that could be linked with the greater region, including then ultimately covering Pakistan, Afghanistan, and then, you know, okay. Caspian Sea Basin countries, and cross Caspian as well. Yes. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Eka. Dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Allow me, on behalf of the government of the Republic of Tajikistan, to express gratitude to the government of the Republic of Azerbaijan for the invitation, warm welcome, and traditional hospitality, as well as for the high level of organization of this event. Today's event is uh, dedicated to a very important topic for the entire world community, peace, and stability. I know that Tajikistan always maintains peace and uh, strives for stabi stability and uh, mutual understanding among the peoples of the entire uh, planet. The reality of the second decade of the 21st century shows that the development of international relations is still in a transition period and a multipolar world system is in the process uh, of uh, formation. In the modern world, profound political and economic changes are taking place, causing effective changes in the system of international relations. Due to its ge geographical location, the Republic of Tajikistan is at the center of the geopolitical interests of the modern world. The proximity of Tajikistan to unstable regions, sources of terrorism, extremist training centers, and drug production sites, and the various obstacles associated with this to effective regional integration, free movement of people and unhindered transportation of goods and services, imperfection in rail, cooperation in the field of uh, rational use of water and energy resources of the region undoubtedly affects its development as a whole. Since the first days of independence, Tajikistan has been implementing an open door policy and in order to achieve sustainable development goals, it has identified a strategic direction for development, including ensuring energy independence, ensuring food security, overcoming the communication impasse, and accelerated industrialization. The identified strategic directions are focused on the effective use of opportunities as well as environmentally friendly material resources important for human health, ensuring the uh, unhindered movement of people, uh, people and goods, providing industrial goods and green energy at a low price for the local population and markets of the countries of the region and the world. Accordingly, the foreign policy of the Republic of Tajikistan is developed and implemented, taking into account the, the existing global 
threats and challenges in regional factor. Dear colleagues, the Republic of Tajikistan is an active participant in uh, bilateral uh, treaties and uh, multilateral conventions as well as regional and international initiatives. The development of the transport sector in Tajikistan is a strategic goal of the government of the country. To achieve this goal with the direct initiative of the President of the Republic of Tajikistan, respected Emom Ali Rahman, at the expense of budgetary funds, private investments, as well as with the support of international financial institutions and donor countries, 60 investment projects uh, totaling more than 2 billion US dollars. Uh, I answered for your question. Uh, dear colleagues, the development of the trade and economy relation requires accelerating the process of integrating national transport systems into the international transport mechanism, while the main goal of this integration is the development of international transport corridors to ensure the free movement of uh, people, uh, goods, and services. The Republic of Tajikistan has identified priority trade and transit corridors uh, that uh, pass through our territory from east to west, from north to south, and are of international importance. Today, work is uh, actively underway to effectively use the corridor Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Turkey, and Europe. The advantage of which is to provide the shortest route from the border of the People's uh, Republic of China to European countries. In addition, this corridor contributes to the revival of the Great Silk Road and regional economic integration. Uh, sorry. Uh, today, one of the most important issues in the industry is the use of environmentally sustainable transport systems, climate change, uh, adaptation, uh, and mitigation. With this in mind, we have developed the program for the development of electric transport in the Republic of Tajikistan for 2023 and 2027. This program is uh, aimed in uh, increasing the competitiveness of the national economy, it, its adaptation to global climate change, ensuring environmental protection and improving the ecological state of the country, uh, achieving the, the sustainable development goals, including ensuring the transition to rational uh, patterns of consumption and production announced by the United uh, Nations General Assembly. Therefore, in connection with the implementation of the plan activities uh, within the framework of the adopted programs in order to ensure uh, sufficient development of transport infrastructure, international and logistics systems, as well as the use of environmentally sustainable transport systems, we consider uh, it um, appropriate to implement the following proposals. One, introduction of new technologies to improve the safety and uh, efficiency of international transportation as well as reduce the financial cost of transport for uh, carriers. Two, providing a trans, uh, transparent information system in the field of transport and logistics services, uh, rules and uh, procedure, taking into account the introduction of uh, inno innovative method, um, intelligent transport system. Third, uh, strengthening uh, and development of international cooperation in the direction of new energy. 
Uh, four, combining the effort of states to integrate logistics centers and digitalize the transport sector of countries in order to obtain the maximum effect from the development of international cargo transportation. And five, uh, implementation of construction projects and improvement of uh, roadside infrastructure along international transport corridors. In conclusion, I would like to uh, note that Tajikistan is committed to active cooperation and uh, is always open to fruitful cooperation with all partners and countries uh, in the field of transport and international transport corridors. Uh, taking this opportunity, I wish you all success in the work of the International Forum. Thank you uh, for attention. Thank you, Minister, and then uh, knowing that um, you have uh, quite a bit of experience, to say the least, in the energy sector with previous years of your public service, I might come back to you in the follow-up questions with relation to hydro energy power related questions and projects that are ongoing right now in this area, uh, which from 2023 could be already operational when it okay. comes to Central Asia, South Asia related uh, projects. Now, I'll turn... Um, to representative of your neighboring country of Kyrgyzstan, former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan, Mr. Domard Otorbaev. And uh, if you could uh, uh, touch base uh, both on energy and then transportation related issues as well, how you see from the perspective of Kyrgyzstan country that has wealth of potential of development of the hydro power but then still faces the problems as it does when it comes to sustainability mm -hmm. of uh, even distribution locally within the country, what it would take for that to have a different perspective and a potential for the future, and how do you see Kyrgyzstan could be part of that new development of the regional projects as well, that mm -hmm. you are, but then, you know, success in this direction. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, on the energy part, uh, I don't have too much to say in terms of international cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, uh, limiting energy, we have to think how to improve generation. So here we're sitting in international uh, audience and people interested in what's happening with international cooperation. And in that respect, let me restrict my intervention uh, on the terms of transport corridors and links. Uh, we are in Central Asia quite emotional about uh, all good times of old Silk Road, when the enormous trade during that time between China and Europe transformed Central Asia to the most prosperous part of the world, where great Azerbaijani poet during that time create his famous stories. Uh, question is, can new Silk Road will be built with emerging of economic power of China and tremendous demand for trade between China and Europe? So we believe that it can be done and that is why in, in Central Asia we are really at paying enormous attention to this topic and even I investigated that matter quite in detail and last month in uh, UK in Rutledge published my book on transport energy corridors between Central Asia, China and Europe. Uh, what happening, I name is Eurasian Rail Revolution. Uh, what happening, let me turn to the numbers. On 19 of March, 2011, when first train departed from Chongqing in China to Duisburg to Germany, most of the experts consider this experiment as a joke. What's happening now? What's happening at the end of 2022? That 16,000 fully loaded trains departed from China to Europe and to Europe to China. It means every hour, almost two full trains move along that way. In each hour, full train. 97% of those 
traffic come through so-called northern route, actually through Russia and Belarus and Central Asia. Even with the slow economic activity in 2022 and the military operation in the heart of Europe, the growth of traffic was again double digits. Let's turn me back to the middle corridor. It's very interesting opportunity to explore it. So, so far the bottleneck of the middle corridor is cost. So just to transport one 20 feet container through the Caspian Sea costs $2,000. And logistic is not yet optimized. But we have observing last two years tremendous growth of the traffic. In 2021, the growth was 52%. In last year, it was another 14, 14, 45%. So through the middle corridor, 500 trains passed, which is uh, not a big number, but this opportunity, these numbers will grow. There is a push uh, mainly from uh, EU part in terms of funding of improving both hard and soft infrastructure of this middle corridor through uh, uh, Ch China, uh, then Kazakhstan, sometimes Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia to uh, sea or straight to the Turkish territory. Uh, so every time this corridor is attracting more attention. Big push from Turkey, uh, Marmaray tunnel under the Bosphorus Strait built to deliver goods to Europe. And of course, our operators and politicians consider it's very important. For example, very important that the uh, uh, Azerbaijani, Kazakhstani and Georgian uh, um, operators created specific freight forwarding consortium. So they work all the time how to improve the logistics, how to cut, cut the cost. So uh, to my mind, uh, the importance of middle corridor will grow. Out of 3% of total market share of the rail transportation, it will grow uh, with the political will of all parties involved, with more funding from all parties involved, uh, and uh, I believe that this cooperation will bring a lot of fruits to the future. And uh, recently, a few months ago, uh, the governments of China, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan decided to build a railroad through Kyrgyz territory to Uzbekistan, which will cut this route for another 800 kilometers. So it will again bring Central Asia transform it from land locked to land connected region. And that is our dream that if this will be working well, then everybody will benefit. We're looking forward to see this in our lifetime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very clear vision how um, advancement in this direction benefits uh, development and cooperation on a global scale but quite a bit of that at the regional uh, scale as well when it comes to more partnerships and then projects within the region as well that could benefit ultimately more security, stability, and then uh, uh, common, common prosperity of the countries in the region as well. That is uh, qu quite a positive vision, vision for the region in this direction. I'll turn to Mr. Bolat Nurgaliev now so that we could see from Kazakhstan's perspective how that all of what was mentioned uh, from your colleagues from Tajikistan, from Kyrgyzstan, votes with the vision of, uh, of Kazakhstan as well in this case. Uh, what are the big grand um, vision projects, ideas from the Kazakhstan side that are matching to the opportunities and challenges of today when it comes to transportation corridors that be or energy projects as well? Thank you, Madam Moderator. It's a real pleasure uh, to meet with the participants of the forum here in beautiful 
Baku. Um, I would like to join my Central Asian friends uh, in expressing our profound gratitude uh, to the Azerbaijani organizers for their warm hospitality, for excellent arrangement of our work and for a very enjoyable uh, atmosphere. You know that across uh, Caspian Sea Basin, there is a healthy competition about who can prove to be a better host, but our Azerbaijani friends are definitely setting the bar very high. Uh, both um, internal and uh, external policies of uh, Kazakhstan are guided by aims of uh, strengthening peace, stability, and uh, fairness. Uh, of course, like it was discussed in previous plenary sessions, uh, we, as the rest of the world, are very concerned by troubling, but unfortunately, prevailing trend of uh, degradation of commitment to act in accordance with the basic principles of international law by a lack of mutual trust and by diminishing readiness to work out compromise resolutions of uh, disagreements between countries. So it is definitely becoming increasingly urgent to return international relations to more healthy, uh, more predictable and mutually accommodating state uh, which will um, facilitate um, working out combined approach to meeting challenges uh, to security and uh, sustainable uh, development. The sheer volume of uh, Kazakhstan's uh, energy hydro hydrocarbon reserves quite naturally place our country among the world's uh, oil powers with a significant role in global energy market. And of course we are fully aware of the accompanying um, responsibility to contribute uh, to global energy security uh, as a reliable, trustworthy uh, partner, extending fair treatment to all interested parties who are striving to participate, to participate in our energy uh, projects. Uh, being a landlocked country and uh, therefore dependent on uh, more favorably located neighbors, uh, Kazakhstan is guided by pragmatic interest to maintain constructive relations with uh, foreign partners, constructive cooperation, uh, foreign partners irrespective whether they are nearby or uh, far away. And uh, like most of post-Soviet republics, Kazakhstan is bound to conduct multi-vector uh, diplomacy. And uh, therefore, we see our role as cooperation promoters of builders of uh, bridges. Infrastructure development acquires critical importance in light of current disruptions of global production and supply chains. And Kazakhstan uh, pursues its uh, national infrastructure building program called Nurli Zhol, which we believe is totally fitting with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, the European uh, Global Gateway, and the American uh, Build Back Better. Uh, just uh, 15 minutes ago, when we already started our session, a news item came that uh, uh, coming May, there will be a economic forum, Central Asia, European Union, where a research report by EBRD on the technical feasibility of the Trans-Caspian um, International Transport Corridor will be uh, presented. So within the uh, framework of Nurli Zhol, our country is striving to develop both domestic and international potential of transport and transit sectors. And of course, recent developments uh, made it necessary to adjust to new realities. So Kazakhstan is shifting to alternative 
uh, roads to deliver its export goods and major efforts are concentrated around the implementation of 6,000 kilometers long uh, Trans-Caspian International Multimodal Transport Route um, in the direction of China, Kazakhstan, across the Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan, then Georgia, and then to uh, Europe. And this uh, Trans-Caspian International Transport Route involving railway and uh, maritime administrations and logistics operators from Azerbaijan, China, Georgia, Turkey, Poland, and some other European uh, countries is also in works. And it's very encouraging that uh, the Baltic states and uh, Uzbekistan uh, signal their readiness to join the uh, project. Our ambition to become a Eurasian logistics hub is based on the capacity to process more than 20 million tons of cargo annually. Uh, as well as the role of the seaport of Aktau and uh, the multi-modal complex uh, in the port of Kurik. Um, sometimes uh, we hear skeptical assessment on the future of the uh, TCRTR, and uh, a colleague from Kyrgyzstan mentioned that there are some uh, bottlenecks. Kazakhstan is aware of that and working uh, to enhance uh, the capacity. So we are planning to construct a container hub and the logistics terminal in um, Aktau, a grain terminal in Kurik, to acquire a dedicated fleet of um, tankers, oil carrying barges and uh, ferries to build a shipbuilding and ship repair plant on the coast and build additional 1,300 kilometers of railroads, railroads thus getting uh, rid of existing bottlenecks. And uh, also to undertake specific measures to draw in the Caspian direction additional freight traffic uh, carried by trucks. Along with the custom legislation Liberalization aimed at um, reducing cargo processing formalities and construction of a fiber optic line between Kazakhstan on the bottom of the Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan. All the above mentioned is designed to significantly uh, increase the viability and uh, prominence of uh, this route in strategic planning of potential mm -hmm. partners. Last year, during um, this official visit to Baku in August, President Kazim Ramar Tokayev underlined Kazakhstan's absolute commitment to develop transportation logistics sphere of cooperation with brotherly Azerbaijan. And there is no doubt in my mind that our bilateral partnership in building economic transportation communication bridge across the Caspian will be marked by specific results, thus uh, moving us uh, to joint implementation of the future described yesterday by President Elham Aliyev. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I just have to mention that uh, all of the uh, small bottlenecks that could be related to regulatory elements and then customs related uh, issues with commitment to the projects from the political angle that we see that is there now from the political leadership. I would say that cooperation in this field is an area where one can streamline quite a bit how much time that we or, or, or easiness of moving cargoes through the countries could actually, at the end of the day, be seen as a result. We end this round of contributions from the uh, speakers with uh, dear friend, uh, Lazar Komanescu. Uh, I think that you, you have that uh, perspective, which is very unique among us now, to give a bit of a helicopter view from the Black Sea area. So how do you see where we are in terms of countries, uh, it, it's a literal countries in the Black Sea area, but then the greater Black Sea area as we, as we see it, right, regionally. 
what are the trends that you see uh, have emerged uh, for the past one year as a continuation of the previous uh, projects and then developments, but then where are we moving as a region? Is there a chance for predictability uh, that uh, everybody's looking for when it comes to businesses, when it comes to private investments, and then reliability of, of uh, implementation of the projects that we're talking about based on the security realm as well? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> uh, dear Eka. First of all, let me start by saying that uh, it's good to be back in, uh, in Baku. And uh, it's uh, not only good, but it's a high honor for me to participate in uh, this 10th edition of the Nizami Gavjani Forum, Global Forum, which I think, and this 10th edition is yet another very convincing proof about the value of this forum. So uh, I uh, thank the organizers for having given me the opportunity to be back here. And before trying to get back to, to, to react to uh, what uh, the points which you raised, uh, Madam Moderator, allow me two or three remarks over, I would say, rather more general nature. First is, well, for my first remark would be that we've witnessed in the last few years uh, particularly in the context of the pandemics, but not only, not to add the very unfortunate development since last year, February last year, the, the war in Ukraine. In all this context, we've been witnessing, uh, let's say, globalization, or I think it's better to, you, to speak about in global interdependencies being questions, questioned. And hence, some tendency, initiatives aiming at uh, some kind of prote prote protectionism, uh, regional or national, uh, let's say, autonomy or self-sufficiency when it comes to the economic development, and so on. My I would say that uh, we want it to not. The reality in the future as well would be that interdependencies will continue to grow. This is my first remark. Second remark, general remark, is that especially when we come to talk about economic development, economic development has been, well, evolving hand in hand with competition. And competition and cooperation do not or should not exclude it, each other. When, I want to stress, when competition is a fair competition. And coming to the area, which, well, the topic of the, today's, uh, this panel, I sincerely hope that uh, initiatives related to transport, uh, routes of uh, trade, such as uh, BRI, or recently agreed upon G7 uh, partnership for global infrastructure, or the EU gate, uh, uh, global gateway would evolve in the context of the spirit of fair competition. Not, hopefully, kind of, let's say, what, what I read from time to time, kind of containment by one or the other. So, once again, uh, interdependencies will continue, will strengthen in the future as well, and the problem is not how to avoid or to associate the idea of resilience with protectionism or uh, changing for various reasons 
the, log the natural way of, in which trade flows should go. The problem is so not to avoid these interdependencies, but to change the paradigm of that. And that can be obtained only through multilateral negotiations. And especially in the context where we have to witness, and we want it or not again, where we see that the multipolar world is developing. So, and uh, looking from all these angles, and looking especially to, to which are the trends in the economic development, we see how important the Eurasian interconnectivity has become and will increase further in the future. So, uh, and here, I think that the region which I, well, the, organize, the region which is uh, covered by the organization which I have the honor to represent here today, uh, becomes the, uh, the evidence of the importance of this region in all this Eurasian, uh, let's say, uh, context, it's self-evident. I would not need to elaborate that much on that. And this is why the, or this organization, the Basic Economic Cooperation Organization, has, be, has put into the center of its activities areas like energy and transport. The, two, uh, the working group of energy, on energy and the working group on transport are the key ones in the, all the structure of, the, of, the, of, of this organization. Well, and I would say that uh, you are asking about projects. Important projects have been imagined and launched by this organization. Just to mention, you know, when we come with the, the famous Black Sea Highway Ring or Black Sea uh, 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 well, Cross uh, B, uh, Black Sea uh, Ways of Transportation. Uh, and uh, others, I would not uh, to, because the time is limited. I would, there are others as well. Well, looking into uh, being, uh, I mean, uh, recognizing that these are important projects, I have to recognize at the same time that progress in that respect has not that much. It's quite modest, quite modest, let's say, speaking in a nice, euphemistical uh, way. Uh, but on the, other, on the other hand, there have been and there are developments which generates at least some kind of optimism. One is well, one example related to transport is the so-called BISEC permit system, of which nine of the 13 member states of the BISEC are part of. And it has been of tremendous uh, utility during the pandemics. And to my to my, I mean, to, to my, I mean, in my opinion, the fact that this permit system has been growing significantly, including in this period of time since February last year, speaks to me about the awareness of making the best possible use of the opportunities which this Black Sea uh, area is offering for this interconnection, as I said, between Euro Europe and Asia. And uh, I, yet another example, now in the area of energy, which has already mentioned, was already mentioned here. And it's, it also is linked to the extremely important aspect of promoting green energy. The agreement which was signed last December uh, in Bucharest by Azerbaijan, Georgia, Hungary, and Romania on the uh, well, green corridor speaks by itself. So there are reasons for optimism, but there we have to do whatever we, effort to, we, we, we may be able to make, and this is something which this organization is striving at. We know, we are aware that there are sensitivities among the countries in the region. But here again, 
well, not to speak about, I mean, this is not about sensitivities, this is about a very unfortunate development, as I said, I mean, the, the war in Ukraine. But there are other sensitivities. The, 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 the let's say, positive sign, I see positive signs there as well. And I'm referring to high-level uh, bilateral dialogues in the countries in the South Caucasus, and also, and I hope that it will be a positive contribution, uh, with the participation of countries or uh, actors outside, from outside the, the Caucasus. And so uh, there are, I would say, prospects, and this organization is working for that. And uh, I would stop just to mention one extremely important uh, aspect already mentioned here, the clean energy. And this is something which, this is, there, there exists already an important forum developed in, with, within the European, with the, within the BSEC, is that of the uh, energy development center uh, of the BSEC, which is mainly directed towards promoting investment in clean energy. And we are working quite actively on that. With this, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I, I, I stood up in that sense. I'm, I'm looking into the time. Uh, we knew that we had a challenge of time with as many speakers as we have. So what we can do now could, um, not the questions or the follow-up questions that we, uh, we could pose to the speakers and especially from the audience, but have a chance for all of you to have final remarks. You've heard all of you, and then some of the issues that you were not able to highlight during your introductory remarks. And one question that I throw to all of you, uh, and then see if uh, any of one of you could pick it up. I keep wondering when I look uh, to the next winter coming up. This winter was mild everywhere in Europe. Uh, we've had China almost on hold when it comes to economic activities. And it's coming back, uh, which is in itself a good uh, phenomenon, but a competition for the energy sources will be much higher. So that when we speak about reliability of price and then uh, sufficiency of the energy supplies, and with that reliability of uh, what the winter will hold for countries that will be still in the challenging mode when it comes to prices, inflation, and then political sensitivities. How do you see that? Are we placed all to tackle the challenge? Are we ready to count on sufficient investment in the areas that will bring more infrastructure and possibilities for the logistics in the transportation as well? Will there be sufficient money and then political commitment to look into that? And then perhaps for our European colleagues as well, just to reflect a bit how much you see that determination for diversification, for reliable, safe partners, both for the energy or trade partnerships will stay intact in Europe and there will be no temptation to maybe uh, get back to the old habits, <laughs> if we can name that in that regard. So please, I will not name you now as the speakers, we'll just go, go with the flow of the physical uh, proximity to each other. So we'll start with the minister. Thank you. <coughs> uh, indeed, it was uh, very interesting uh, to listen to all speakers of our panel. And let me then, uh, to summarize, um, the, maybe the energy part from the perspective of Azerbaijan, what we, what we have done and what we can do next for the sake of the uh, energy security and uh, energy supply uh, uh, policy. Um, first of all, on the short uh, term uh, basis, we have uh, uh, added uh, more volumes of natural gas for Europe. And uh, last year we had 40% uh, of um, grow in our gas supply. This year we are going to increase our natural gas uh, exports uh, further. And at the same time, uh, we work uh, intensively on the issue of expansion of the Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, so uh, due to the strategic agreement with Europe, we are going to double 
our volumes uh, by 2027, and we have already actually started uh, to do that. In January this year, we had the first binding uh, test for the expansion of the uh, Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, which uh, means automatically the upgrade of the whole uh, southern gas uh, corridor. So, and the first 1.2 BCM has been already booked for the for the for the for the project. So, in the uh, this in the in the mid term, of course, we are going to uh, continue our dialogue with our partners in Europe. Uh, for the perspective of the expansion of the SGC, and uh, we are holding now uh, the consultations with more than 10 countries, actually with 14 countries, and with some of them we have already signed some uh, preliminary uh, papers, which are actually the MOUs, which actually already define uh, the our future cooperation. With others we continue this uh, to do. And on the long term, we, as it, it has already been um, discussed here, we started to realize this um, uh, four lateral, at least at the beginning, four lateral uh, project of, uh, let me say, to call it of the, uh, the project of the 21st century, because it's going to deliver from the Caspian Sea the huge resources uh, of green energy in the form of electricity, green electricity, or the green gases uh, to the European continent. So connecting Caspian with the European Union. And let me also call that project as a green corridor. And of course, uh, it is not uh, the, uh, the, the simple, uh, issue, the issue, and we are, we have already started to work very intensively with our uh, partners on that uh, project. The first uh, meeting of the ministers took place here on the 3rd of February. The next one is going to be in uh, Tbilisi soon, and we work hard on that issue. Another, uh, uh, the corridor, which actually is going to be as my colleague, the uh, Minister of Transport, uh, uh, Mr. Rashad Na, uh, um, Nabiev mentioned, uh, Zengizur project is going to be the transport and at the same time we see this uh, corridor as an energy corridor, which will create additional opportunity to connect mainland with Nakhchivan and then to have access to the uh, Turkish energy market, and from there, as Turkey is the member of uh, the part of the ENSOE, so to reach again uh, the European energy zone. So these are uh, our plans that are actually very high on, on our agenda. Unfortunately, due to the time limit, l the limited, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, there's so much to say, but I'm going to pick an area that I'm probably unique on this panel, and that's the private sector. Mm -hmm. And what, what does the private sector look at? And uh, I've learned so much today. It's been very interesting. But it's transport, offtake, and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And it, it, focusing on transport is absolutely key. If you can't get th things moved, if you can't move it, then you can't use it. I used to say logistics will eat your strategy for lunch. So you can have the best strategy in the world, but if you screw up your logistics and your transport, you screw up your strategy. So transport. So I, I, I learned a lot from Tajikistan. Um, the, the need for smart logistics is key. Um, Iran, I think, is the second largest supply chain and transportation operation in the world. If you don't have smart logistics, you're, you're dead. So continuing to support. And Anna, I strongly support your comment about you've got to start now. You, in 2011, you started the Southern Gas Corridor. It paid off in 2021. And look what you needed in 2021. It was a home run. So Minister of Transport from Azerbaijan, that vision and that leadership we need. Um, secondly, offtake. 
We've got that. We've got it. Uh, it becomes a mechanism to make Azerbaijan a premium location for investment. And that's what you want. When we met with the president, he said, now the issue is how we fund all this. You fund it by being a premium location for investment. And I've just got to make a comment on manufacturing because I missed that. In this hydrogen hub that can exist in Azerbaijan, manufacturing is key. If you're going to have wind, and wind is the anchor in Azerbaijan, you've got to manufacture turbines where you're going to use them. In the last 18 months, logistics costs for turbines have gone up 400 percent. They represent 10 percent of your costs. Think about one of those big turbine blades. How do you think those get moved? It's very expensive. You've got to build them where you're going to use them. So I just say um, transport, uh, uh, offtake, and manufacturing. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Eka, I'll be very, very, very short. Uh, you are right. The winter was uh, the warmest maybe, I don't know, since how many years. Uh, the re reliability of the Azerbaijan as a partner, their fast reaction saved us. Uh, but we should invest more. What we have done uh, during the years, uh, built interconnectors with all the neighbors, start uh, um, building interconnector with Serbia, which was missing, the only one was missing, uh, became a shareholder um, three years ago, actually, in LNG Terminal uh, Alexandropoulos in Greece. We expect uh, the construction uh, to, to finish at uh, the end of next year. We, uh, of course, are in permanent contact with uh, our Azerbaijanis friends uh, to uh, increase import from Azerbaijan if it's possible. And um, the, the Bulgarian um, the, uh, company assigned a contract with uh, the Turkish counterpart uh, for access to uh, free LNG terminals. So we should act now, not to suffer later, as uh, it was the case uh, last year. Thank you. Thank you. Minister? Well, uh, I believe uh, there are lessons learned from the last year, and specifically for, for last two months of this year, uh, for all the players in the middle corridor. And the first and most important thing, we cannot be opportunistic. We have to play in the longer run. There, last year, there has been several attempts to increase the tariffs, uh, to be very much opportunistic. And because the businesses are being managed by the expectations, especially the transport and logistics businesses, and they, anyway, they will find the alternatives. So we have to be uh, clever in getting together and harmonizing our tariff policy uh, in uh, bringing down the, all the uh, uh, bureaucratic hurdles that we are posing in front of our players and also coordinating all our efforts when it comes to the de bottlenecking the infrastructure shortcomings that we have. And everything which I've mentioned so far that comes to this one single point, which is about the cooperation and the collaboration. And I believe we all together, uh, if we get together, that's the case at the, at the time being, we can make our uh, corridor both effective, which is the case now, and also efficient for all the players. It's not only just delivering the goods, but it's also a matter at what time, at, at what price you're delivering the goods. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, in uh, 25 years, uh, more than 50% of world GDP will be produced in Asia. Uh, our countries are in between, and we will be part of this enormous growing potential. So we need to create all kinds of links between great leading power, powers like China, India, Europe, and play a significant role in connecting them. Uh, so I believe that the revival of the new great Silk Road is not far from us. In terms of middle corridor, uh, I want to say that I, I feel that it will bring a very big success. Uh, not only because of uh, kind of landscape, geography, politi political considerations, uh, uh, it will be not only transport uh, connectivity or energy connectivity, it also will add to it emotional connectivity. So move from Altai Mountains to the uh, Bosphorus, this is something which 
our ancestor did long time ago. So I believe these steps will add another dimension to the success of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Я буду очень краток, только два предложения. Относительно вот, э, значит, транспортных взаимосвязанностей Китай, Таджикистан, Узбекистан, э, Туркменистан, Тур, Турция, далее Европа. Это очень хороший проект, который сейчас мы над ним работаем. Это для мультимодальной перевозки. Это первый. Второй, э, наши энергетические мощности, которые э, в ближайшем будущем будут играть ключевой роль, поскольку Таджикстан сейчас располагает около 6 тысяч мегаватт мощности, но мы строим э, Рагунский ГЭС, гидроэлектростанции, мощность, которая составляет 3600 мегаватт. И по, при поддержке Всемирного банка сейчас строится линия КАСА-1000, КАСА – это Централ Эжа Сауша, же тысяч мегаватт, которые будут обеспечивать и Афганистан, и э, Пакистан. 30% загружается нашими э, киргизскими друзьями, и 70% мощность из Таджикистана. Поэтому, если взять о региональной взаимосвязанности, Таджикистан все делает для того, чтобы не только им самим, но и соседям было хорошо. Спасибо. Cooperation was uh, underlined here. And I think that I was, I ne we need to associate this, this idea of cooperation also with the idea of better correlation and coordination among various actors, including international organizations. Because we have, for example, we have, okay, BSEC, we have Traseca, we have the European Union strategy for the Danube region, we have the, the EU strategy for the Central Asia. I dream, for example, including in terms of a green energy and saving energy to a corridor of transport all throughout the Danube, through the BSEC, through the, through the Black Sea, to the Caucasus and further on to Caspia. Point number one. Point number two, we want, we it or not, being successful in all these type of undertakings, whatever type, without the direct involvement in the shaping and decision of decision, the decision making of the entrepreneurial community, we simply talk. Thank you. I think a few lessons are learned. Firstly, energy is a security issue, and in this regard, you really need to treat it this way, including from the, media, uh, you know, from the point of medium to long-term planning, strategy planning, including how wisely you choose your strategic partners. And again, here I'm coming back to how Azerbaijan is helping us, us Romania and us uh, Europe. Uh, secondly, energy is a human rights. Uh, and from that point of view, we need to be wise and we, need, we owe it to uh, our uh, citizens to uh, ensure uh, affordable and reliable um, energy, including from the cost point of view. Um, I do believe that it is wise to have uh, that energy mixed, and I think from this point of view, Europe learned its lesson, but we ought to be very careful not to uh, replace one dependency with another dependency. That's why I believe that the South Co uh, Gas Corridor and the future submarine cable that we were talking about, uh, you know, for the transmission of the electricity produced in Azerbaijan from renewable sources uh, will contribute significantly to the energy security of the European Union as a whole. And from that point of view, I think the Caspian Sea and uh, at center Azerbaijan will be critical to the security of Europe from the energy point of view, but not just from the energy point of view, because we've been, you know, the Minister of Transportation was mentioning the goods. So that's why I believe that Romania actually is going to be that provider of energy security in our region. It has that potential, and we will be the hub, practically the gateway between Asia and Europe. And Eka, I, I want to, uh, to uh, you know, finish by thanking you and commend you for, by the, uh, you know, the way no, you actually it's, it's directed it's us and moderated this well, panel. Words of appreciation for me, for you to will come in a minute, but <laughs> vice versa, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. <coughs> Just w one point. Uh, within the expert uh, community, there is often discussion about the, the uh, role of uh, BRI, or the Chinese Strategic Initiative, and uh, Kazakhstan's uh, participation in it. So I uh, often ask the question from my Western colleagues, especially uh, whether Kazakhstan should be uh, that Kazakhstan should be aware of the inherent 
risks of uh, active participation. Though I have to answer, and uh, I would call on the uh, participants to think in terms of uh, this, their, uh, the uh, opportunity and the compatibility with the um, other uh, initiatives like uh, uh, Global Gateway on big Build Back uh, Better, because uh, uh, this is the uh, chance to look into how we can cooperate instead of uh, look, trying to find some uh, uh, liabilities in uh, uh, this process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I want you to thank all of you uh, for your wisdom, for your thoughts that you've shared with us, for endurance of you and of audience as well being engaged in this long conversation. But I think uplifting takeaway that we all have from this discussion is that we are not in this region, in this part of the world, in Europe, in America, sitting and then just thinking of how complex and challenging the world is. We've been working on those issues. There were plans that have been developed. They have been accelerated. And what is more important, there is full commitment to work together on those issues and bring more stability, peace and prosperity for our people, for global development as well. And as long as we have people engaged like you in all of it, in practical terms, we are well off in terms of being on that road. So I thank you all of you uh, to taking your time and then being with us. And then round of applause, please, for our participants. <laughs>